going to run up an active volcano, which clearly means that I have the worst judgment in the world, and that you probably shouldn't trust anything that I say, actually, is maybe the takeaway. I am so excited to be here that I've grown a beard since that last photo was taken. I'm very excited. <sighs> How are you all doing? You look terrific. You look very nice today. I'm here to talk a little bit about how we all can uh, engage with new technology. And we're going to talk specifically about machine learning. One of the things that I really liked about Tom's intro was not only your beautiful voices, but also sort of the observation that he made that a lot of times we don't think we belong in a certain role or project. We don't think we're musicians. I'll take that metaphor to also sort of apply to, I think, how designers are maybe scratching their heads a little bit about machine learning. That as we look at algorithmic interfaces, this has been a world that's really been driven by data scientists, algorithmic algorithm engineers. I think a lot of designers are sort of trying to figure out what their role is. And just as with the music example, I would say that you do have an important role in this, and I would say actually an urgent role. So we're going to talk today a little bit about how do you bring machine learning into your everyday practice? How do you think about it? What is your role and what is your responsibility? But I think more broadly, it's sort of an important thing just to sort of think about it, step back, and think about how do we just in, in general engage with new technologies? How do we use new technologies, not only as designers, but also as, as consumers, as users, as customers of these things? So let's take a look at how it often feels when we're uh, st starting to use a new technology, or, or what new technologies look like in their first generation. And friends, I want to remind you of a product called the Juicero from maybe a year or two ago. Some of you might be familiar with this. It's about a $700 internet-connected fruit and vegetable juicer. Now, the Juicero's big innovation was that it actually didn't juice fruit or vegetables. It, it squeezed these packets that you could get. Very impressive, I know, that you're already impressed by this technology, right? It squeezes packets, and it turns out that, frankly, you didn't actually strictly need the machine to squeeze the packets, that if you did it by hand, you would have the exact same result as if you used your $700 internet-connected fruit and vegetable juicer. And you might, if you had bought this, sort of be disappointed by this fact. But it's sort of, there is still some useful technology here. It turns out that uh, the device could also scan this barcode, which could helpfully tell you if uh, the, the packet, the juice, had expired. That information was also printed on the back of the packet. So again, so you're sort of, at this point, sort of stuck with this thing that has some fancy hints of technology, but ultimately does no work and solves no useful need. And it turns out, that this is part of a long history of abuses in designer juicers. Uh, you might be familiar and have seen uh, this juicer that was designed by Philippe Stark back in the 90s. Uh, and if you tried to use this to juice a lemon, you would just make a mess everywhere, right? But it's OK, because Philippe Stark tells us that his juicer was not meant to squeeze lemons. It's meant to start conversations. Oh, that's some bullshit right there, right? This strikes me as being self-serving, when our job is to serve others. This is something that's sort of falling in love with the making of the thing. And I think this is something that, that we often struggle with, maybe, as designers and of technologists, is our own ego, the enthusiasm for the making of the thing rather than the service that the thing might do for others. And the modern kitchen is full of stuff like this. Here's a Wi-Fi-enabled kettle, which I know you all have been waiting for. A gentleman named Mark Rittman in the UK uh, owns one of these. And he set about trying to make a cup of tea. Uh, but the kettle encountered a little bit of network trouble. And it turns out that it couldn't connect. And the kettle asked to be recalibrated. Three hours later, the thing had sabotaged his Wi-Fi router, and the kettle had slipped into some nether region corner of his network. Mark is undefeated. Here he is port scanning the network in search of his kettle. Ten hours later, he got the kettle back online. He's enjoying his tea. But then his smart lights cut out because they needed a firmware upgrade. And I will say, friends, that the internet was not entirely sympathetic. Uh, sorry for the language. I'm just the messenger. Just the messenger here. 
Here's an excerpt from a review from Fast Company of yet another automated kitchen device, and it doesn't even matter which one at this point, because I think this description feels so familiar to us as users sometimes of first generations of technology. Automated yet distracting, boastful yet mediocre, confident yet wrong. In other words, we're dealing with these sort of fragile technologies that are used maybe in ways that they aren't yet ready to, or maybe that they never should have been used for. And I think these are signals that we often don't understand the grain of the technology, how it wants to be used. So you know, I think one of the things that's really important when you come into any new technology, and we're going to really focus on machine learning and artificial intelligence today, but how do we use technology in a way that it wants to be used? That plays to its strengths and avoids its weaknesses in a way that adds meaning to our lives, that bends to our lives instead of our lives bending to the technology. And really, ultimately, I think the most important thing is how does it sort of help us to be all that we can be, to amplify our human potential instead of replace it? And I think these questions are especially important at moments when we enter a new chapter of technology. And I think this is one of those times. We're working in digital design uh, at an incredibly exciting moment with the arrival of a new design material called machine learning. Um, I run a digital product agency in New York called Big Medium, and our focus is on design for what's next, sort of helping companies engage with emerging new technologies and opportunities to create something that is truly meaningful, not only for the business, but for their customer. And for the last decade or so, a lot of that focus has been on mobile, sort of pushing at the frontiers of of what, makes, of, of what mobile can enable for us personally with all of its sensors and going beyond just the simple fact of mobility to this fact that it can now interact with the world around us. In the last few years, though, I've found that more and more the opportunities and questions that my clients have come to me with is, what do we do with big data? What do we do with machine learning? What do we do with algorithmic interfaces? And so if mobile defined the last decade of product design, I believe, and I think we're already seeing, that machine learning is already defining the next. Uh, and I think, again, a lot of designers don't yet understand their role in this, but I think there's an urgent role for all of us, and that's what I want to discuss today. How do you work with machine learning as a design material? And what I mean by that is just like in the same way that HTML and CSS are design materials and want to be used in a certain way, or like great prose and language is a design material, or dense data visualizations are a, are a design material. It's important to understand its texture, not only how it can be used, but as I mentioned, how it wants to be used. And so whenever we encounter a new technology that we can work with as a material, I think it's these questions that are important to ask. What can it do for us? Why should I use it in the first place? But also, what is its grain? And so in the same way that if you were a craftsperson working with wood and a certain sort of wood, you want to work with the grain of the wood and not against it to play to its strengths and avoid its weaknesses, what are the specific strengths and weaknesses, the texture of this new design material? And finally, how does it change us? Not only what does it offer us, but what does it require of us? And what is, how does it change us as designers, but also as customers or even as a society? And what is the intention that we bring to this stuff? That's what we're going to talk about, those three topics. That sound all right? Yeah, did I mention? You guys look great. I do. All right. Oh, sorry. All right. Let's keep going. All right. The first question, so what can it do for us? Or another way to put it is, why team up with machine learning anyway? And I think the big opportunity here is really that if we could detect patterns in anything, how might we act on them? What would we do with those? And I want to sort of start by talking about five applications, five, five sort of forms that machine learning might take in your everyday products, but also four questions that we can, we can bring to this, like four, four types of questions that machine learning can answer. And let me start with these five applications. I'm going to walk through each of these, just some very sort of simple examples. The first is recommendation, and it's a sort of a super familiar form to us. Let's look to Slack for an example of recommendation. Slack launched a feature about a year ago for big teams that helps you find people who talk about certain topics. So this is machine learning that helps you find experts in your organization. If you need an expert in hiring process, Isabella is your go-to here, right? So this is recommendation. It's very simple. It's a ranked list of documents that match a specific context or concept. 
And in this case, it's sort of, it's not just a brute for, force keyword search on this topic. It's sort of saying, oh, let's understand the concepts that these persons are associated with and then give you ranked documents, in this case, people, of recommendation. Very simple, you know, familiar concept. It's closely related to classification, which I'll discuss in a bit, but also to prediction. Why, hello. Hello there. Oh, yeah, that feels good. Right there. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you. OK, so this is related to classification, but also to prediction. Uh, and I'll talk about classification in a moment, but let's start with prediction. Predictive keyboards, another example of just everyday machine learning, the statistically most likely next word showing up above the keyboard, just this simple intervention to speed the error-prone task of touchscreen typing. And that's prediction. Based on historical data, here are the things most likely to happen next. Again, sort of a familiar concept. Classification. Google Forms, which many of you are, are likely familiar with, survey building tool. And when you add your questions, you choose the format of the answer you want. And the default is multiple choice, radio buttons. But there are a lot of options here. And they've made it as simple as they could, but it still takes some time and thought. So look what happens, though, when you start typing the question text and how that changes the answer format. How satisfied are you? maps to a linear scale. They added a little machine learning to the mix to look at your question and classify it to a specific answer type. So which of the following apply maps to checkboxes. It's just this convenient bit of intelligence to make the process easier. So classification is human-generated categories where the machines map content or data into those categories. You might notice just with this first set of examples, it's like, wait a second, this is not the sentient robot butler artificial intelligence assistant that I thought Josh was going to tell us how to make. These are really, he's talking about form fields. Is that really sort of the kind of the future of what we're looking at with machine learning? And I guess I would say that one of the most important things, actually the stuff that I may be most excited about, is how we can start using almost casual uses of intelligence to make every portion of the user journey a little bit easier. I mentioned before, you know, that I think that, th that this is beginning to define product design in the same way that mobile did, in the same way that we need to be easy and casual and familiar with designing for small screens as well as large screens. I think we need to get as comfortable with designing for sort of casual uses of machine learning in the same way that we would think nothing of sprinkling a little bit of JavaScript into a web page to add some interactivity. We now have the services and the tools, and we'll talk about where you can get those. You now have the services and tools now to sprinkle a little intelligence into the page. You can quote me on that, friends. Let's sprinkle a little machine learning on it. It doesn't have to be the big tentpole feature. Let's think about how we can sort of use a little bit of intelligence and pattern matching to make everyone's job easier. There are bigger opportunities, too, where the machines can discover new insights. And that's where clustering comes in, sort of the last uh, element that I'll talk about before generation. This can feel like either magic or nonsense, depending on what the result is. The idea here is that it's, it's like categorization, but completely unsupervised. The machines just go out and find patterns. It says these things are different from normal in these particular ways, in the same ways, in these common ways. So that's a cluster. Here's another group that's different from average in other ways. That's another cluster. So it's classification, but it's done by machine logic, not human logic. The machines determine the classifications. And what that means is that it can see things that we wouldn't, not only because of the scale of data that it can sort of hunt and find these groupings and clusters, but also because machines simply sort of find patterns that we're not used to. They have a different way of seeing the world, perhaps. So, Clustering is a way to identify things that depart from the, from the normal or from the average. So you use this to find crime or, or fraud or disease or spending outside of the norm. And so the idea here is that groups of data points that sit outside the norm in an interesting way. That also means you can use it to identify clusters of products or customers or people by behaviors or associations that might not be immediately apparent or obvious. But let me show you just sort of a fun, kind of playful combination of, of both clustering and generation. 
Douglas Summers Stay is a, a, a researcher in machine learning who's interested in artificial creativity. So not just artificial intelligence, but artificial creativity. How do you do sort of generate interesting new things that, that feel like a creative action? So he created a wordplay generator where you give the system a word or an idea, like rocking chair, and it comes back with a two-word rhyming description, like knitter sitter. Star Wars gives you Droid overjoyed. It's a whole bunch of these. The system that's based on semantic vectors, it organizes words that have strong associations. That's the clustering. And then here, it finds those words and then runs them through a separate algorithm to find the pairs that rhyme. So this is just a fun example of this, and we'll look at more powerful clustering examples uh, later, as well as sort of generation. But just sort of an idea of this is sort of the five things that you can incorporate in your products, the ways that you can think about this. And again, they don't have to be big, giant, tentpole features. These are things that you can also think of as small, helpful enhancements, uh, even to sort of the, the, the plain and basic web form. It's interesting, though, as we sort of to get some perspective to think about what happens when we apply this stuff to the kind of work that we do every day. Some of you probably recall QuickDraw, a Google experiment from a few years ago, basically Pictionary, where it challenges you uh, to make a sketch, and then the, the system tries to identify what you're drawing. So let's give it a try. Let's draw a mountain. OK, so I get in here, I draw a mountain. It says, oh, I know, it's a mountain. Great, easy one. I kind of got the hang of that one right away, a calculator. I see a square, a triangle, an elbow, a dishwasher. Oh, I know, it's a calculator. Yeah, that's pretty good. All right. What does it know about a hamburger? A shoe, a hot dog, a hot tub, bread. It's a hamburger. I didn't even get to draw my little like condiments on there. Flip-flops, sandals. All right, I see a nose, a potato, a peanut. It's flip-flops. It is not a flip-flop. It doesn't even resemble a sandal, right? It's not even close. What's going on here? So one of the things it can do is it will show you uh, what some of the sort of adjacent patterns are. So if you go in here, you can sort of see, whoops, let's go to go back. Uh, you can see it's sort of like that the, the, the symbol here for flip-flops is very simple, similar to, it turns out, potato and bread. But if you also look at what other people drew, you can see actually sort of a, a pattern emerging. These are not lifelike drawings of a flip-flop, of a sandal. These are instead sort of similar symbols. Oh, it's an oval with a little chevron, an arrow inside of it. That's the symbol for a sandal. If you think about it, it's like we use symbols like that all the time in the work that we do and the wireframes that we draw. And you're starting to see more and more projects emerging to sort of try to make sense of those drawings. One of them is a web app called Weezard, I think. U-I-Z-A-R-D, Weezard, like GUI. You decide. Weezard.io. Uh, and the idea here is that you take uh, the camera and you point it at a sketch. In this case, I've made this one. It's a very sort of simple, uncomplicated inbox sketch. It takes a few seconds, and then it loads it into the system. I'll take you to the, web to the desktop view, where you can see uh, the image that I drew on the left. And then there in the middle, the uh, interface that Weezer drew from that. Now, it also makes, as, as part of this, a sketch file and an HTML file that, uh, that reflects these things. And it did a pretty good job there. You can see it had like sort of two search boxes in there, but otherwise pretty good basis. When you get into the sketch file, you can see, oh, it's, it's got sort of these are actual sketch objects. This is text that I can edit. Here's a, a little thumbnail image that I can drag around or resize. All these sort of rows are put into a group. They're organized together. It understands that these are sort of logical elements. If you click into one of these things, you sort of see, oh, wait a second. These are sketch symbols. This is just a library of symbols. And it becomes clearer what has happened, is that the system has taught, uh, the system has been taught this, the notation that maps to each one of these symbols. Now, let's take a look at what it looks like in markup, because a lot of times these systems have terrible markup. It's like, oh, all right, great. Sort of a fluid design, kind of a, a, a poor man's responsive design. You look at the markup, though, it's actually really well formed. It's doing the right things around putting label tags around the checkbox elements and, and all that. It looks pretty good. But this might not be your organization's code style. And it's almost certainly not your visual style. But if you pull back and think about what it's doing, 
is what if you could map those notations to your organization's style? That's actually something that uh, the folks at Airbnb have been playing around with a lot, is thinking about um, you know, how do we actually take a design system and map that to these sort of notations. And so in a hackathon, just sort of over the course of a day, they cobbled together a system that understands sketches and maps those to patterns from their design system. So you can draw a sketch, and it creates an instant prototype. This is not something you would ship, but it sort of gives you a scaffolding to get started. If you think about it, this is what a design system is all about, taking the solved solutions that we've already got as an organization and creating a common vocabulary around them so that we can share those easily between designers and developers. That a designer doesn't have to do a comp, they can do a quick sketch, and the developer says, got it, I know it, put that in, we've already solved that. Jesenia will be talking about design systems a lot more tomorrow. But once you've got a common vocabulary, why not share that with the machines so that they can also help with that work? Or, you know, once you've got a vocabulary, maybe you don't even need the sketch at all. Maybe you can just say, hey, Alexa, give me this prototype. Right? Now, some of you, you might be thinking, well, wait a second. That sounds a lot like my job. It sounds like what I do. I'm the one who's responsible for making those comps or for translating those comps into a front-end markup or code. And I would say that is not your job. That is sort of the clerical part of your job. That is where you are transcribing ideas into these things. The real part of your job is figuring out what is the problem to be solved. Do we have UI components that address that problem, or do we have to address something new? If we've already got it, that's great. It's, we're done. Move on. In other words, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about, this sort of low-level production work, this is actually the time-consuming, repetitive, detail-oriented, error-prone, joyless part of our job. It's not the really creative, problem-solving part. This is not the stuff that we probably wake up in the morning and are like, I can't wait to do more joyless tasks. Awesome, I'm excited for this. But you know what? The robots love that stuff. They love doing these tasks. They're great at them. So let's let the machines do these things so we can focus on what we do best. To pull out to another industry, here's, here's another example of that. We did some work with a healthcare company, and they were zeroing in on ways to help radiologists do their job better. Radiologists, the people who look at images and scans and x-rays, uh, looking for problems. But it turns out that so much of the time isn't spent looking at a single scan, but at just dozens and dozens of scans every day, most of them with no problem at all, which is good news, but doesn't exactly use their skills to the best. So what this company was able to do was to get computer vision to do a huge amount of triage so that the radiologists could apply their actual expertise. And so in other words, the machines are bringing the doctors the interesting cases. They took over that time-consuming, repetitive, detail-oriented, error-prone, joyless part of the work that the radiologists could focus on what they were doing. Very successful. So in other words, I think the opportunity here and the way to think about this is how can we let people do what they do best? Identify and optimize for that by letting machines do what they do best because they are never the same thing. How can we have a useful partnership between the two? And again, sort of what we're talking about here is then amplifying our humanity by letting the machines help by doing the things that they are uniquely good at, things are uniquely possible through machine learning. In other words, the goal here for any sort of algorithmic interface should be about focusing attention and judgment and not replacing it. Because the machines, it turns out, are, are bad at doing that. How do we clear away the noise and help signal where we can do our most interesting and creative work? Our industry has spent a lot of time making the machines more capable. I think we can do more to sort of uh, put a premium on how we might augment human capability. So let's start with that human need. So again, it comes back to this. What if we could detect patterns in anything and act on them? I think there's four ways to sort of think about that. I promised five applications, which we talked about. I want to talk about four questions. And the first is, we can be smarter with questions that we already ask. We can use classification or clustering to understand conceptual relationships between documents or people or, friend or trends, for example. So like that Slack example, sort of it used to be that we would have to do a brute force keyword search through every post that somebody had made in Slack. 
machine learning has made it possible to sort of have some semantic concepts around what people talk about. So now we can search for that concept and find that. So in other words, we're, we're, we're getting better at answering that question that we already asked. How do I find somebody who's an expert in this? The machines are better at that. It gets more interesting, though, when we think about how can we ask entirely new kinds of questions. If you work in a customer care center, you, know, you now have the ability not just to sort of search for uh, you know, kind of customer emails by text or by topic, but by emotion. Show me the urgent emails. Show me the angry emails. Or maybe you want to start easy. Show me the happy, friendly emails. How can we sort of ask entirely new kinds of questions now that the machines are able to make sense of things like sentiment? I think something we're seeing more and more of, too, is how can we unlock new sources of data? The machines are now able to understand all of the messy ways that we communicate as human beings. Speech, natural gesture, uh, handwriting, doodles photos, videos, these things used to be completely opaque to the machines. Now they can be a new source of data or even a new surface of interaction, as we're seeing with things like speech interfaces or augmented reality with computer vision. And the last thing I'll mention, and this, is, this goes back to the clustering, is how can we find patterns that were not visible to us at all? to deliver new insights, discover new customer segments, new behaviors, new uh, causes of fraud or disease or climate change. So just sort of four ways to think about what the opportunities are with that. And I, I think those are sort of the important bit because when you get right down to it, and this is true for any technology, but I think it's especially important when you engage with new ones, is that our job in all of this for UX designers is to find those slices of opportunities, like with the radiologist, that one piece, or with design, that transcription from sketch into prototype. What's that one sort of slice or opportunity that the machines are really good at that stuff, and those are the things that we find to be more joyless or harder at? All right, that's what this stuff is good for. I want to talk a little bit, too, about what its grain. And what I mean by what is its grain is sort of what is the sweet spot of machine learning? What are the unique characteristics, both strengths and weaknesses, that we need to design into, or, or in some cases, avoid? I'm going to talk about five of these things. There are many. Uh, and for the folks who are in my workshop know that we could spend a whole day talking about this. I'm going to talk just about a few of these things. And the first one, friends, is, man, the machines are weird. They study the world, they sift through enormous volumes of evidence and data, and they come to what I think is fair to say some pretty surprising conclusions. Here's one example. It takes a human being about 14,000 brain hours to learn to run. Now, it turns out that an AI can figure out how to run in less than half as many CPU hours, but the results are like this. So they use in the arms for forward momentum with kind of little consideration of the physics of friction or the realities of rotator cuffs. But then again, we also come up with some pretty strange approaches to locomotion ourselves. Witness, for example, the prancer size craze of 2013 straight out of Florida. Oh yeah, you guys. See, I'm not making you stand up and, and do this. I could. When people are so difficult to understand and so often unpredictable and eccentric, how can we expect the machines always to make sense of what's happening? So, you know, if you think about it, if it's that the machines are weird, it's in part because we are weird, right? They only know what we show them and they have to sort of make sense of the patterns within that. We may never totally understand what we look like to the machines from the other side. We communicate in ways that are not always predictable, that we ourselves as human beings find hard to understand, or that sometimes that are sort of just fanciful. What do the machines make of us as creators or artists? This is a Renoir painting in the collection of the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia. And when curators ran it through a computer vision algorithm for identification, they were thinking perhaps we can use this to auto-tag or describe our collection. The robots confidently identified it as a boy holding a teddy bear. Now you might look at this and think, this doesn't seem like it's very successful. I'm not exactly sure that this is the wall text we want to put on this painting. 
But uh, it turned out that they didn't actually strictly see this as a failure. When they asked a neural network to find cherubs in their collection, it found things that definitely were not cherubs, little angels, but yet were also cherub-like. And the curators began to find some interesting connections in their own collection that they had not themselves made, that this was things that, that crossed and did not organize around the schools of art or, uh, um, or, or sort of, of time that they organized works, or even of, of form or media. Shelley Bernstein led this machine learning effort, and she described these associations as magic that these unexpected results had generated new insights. So sort of the point is, is that because the machines are weird and because they sometimes have a perspective that we do not agree or that we would not apply, there is this creative friction that we're able to draw from it. How can we sort of take that weirdness and turn that into an asset to draw insight from the unexpected? Speaking of unexpected, let's talk about unexpected visitors. Uh, B.J. May is a, a gentleman who has one of those Nest doorbells uh, outside his house. It's the kind that has a little camera on it. And he had done a little bit of extra hacking on it to make this doorbell automatically lock when the Nest doesn't recognize someone. But one day, it didn't recognize him, and it locked the door on him. And he, he went to investigate what had happened. And what it had found is sort of like, do you want to let this guy in? Because he seems a little angry. Not quite sure that that's sort of who we want to get in here, which is a pretty good call. I don't, yep, I'm going to lock the door on that guy. The machines perceive and interpret the world very differently than we do. And so weirdness and unpredictability and sometimes mistakes are sort of essential to this design material, which means that this is our work now. The more that I work with machine-generated results and machine-generated conclusions, and especially machine-generated interaction, where the machines and people are talking to each other directly with no mediation, the more that I realize I am not in control of this experience as a designer, and that's new. You know, most of my career has been spent designing fixed paths through information that is completely under my control. Uh, we're used to designing for success, for the happy path. And now we have to anticipate a whole fuzzy range of results and confidence. So this is why it's important to understand the, the texture, the strengths and weaknesses of your model, to understand its limitations and constraints. And in my workshop yesterday, those of you who were there, you know, we spent a lot of time actually looking at some of these models to understand what they were good at, where they were wrong, where they were right. What were the ingredients for the interfaces that we could build? This is always our job, but it's especially important now in this particular field. How do we set appropriate expectations for what the system can do and then channel behaviors in ways that actually map the system's capabilities? Siri and Alexa and Google Assistant, the expectation they set is, ask me anything. And as amazingly capable as these systems are, that expectation is so beyond what their capabilities are that they constantly disappoint us, that we try to ask it anything, ask it questions that they can't understand. How can we do better? And that's a hard question. I and mean, it's not a knock on the folks who make that. That is really hard. How do you sort of advertise the thousands of things that you can do and the billions of things that you can't do on these systems? I think one thing that you can do, though, to sort of help to shape behavior and also soften mistakes is to use this technique, which, of course, is base app. Be as smart as a puppy, friends. Which is about as smart as a lot of these systems are. It's a useful way to think about it. This is a quote from uh, Matt Jones of the late, great digital agency Berg London, which was sort of made all kinds of digital weirdness. Matt is at Google now. And he came up with this way to think about creating honest, gentle interfaces for our weird systems. He said, our goal should be making smart things that don't try to be too smart and that make endearing failures in their attempts to learn and improve. And that doesn't mean that your business critical application has to be cute and adorable, but it does have to be sort of something that kind of sets the expectations of just how smart it is and when it's right or when it's wrong and that you are, you're able to sort of forgive its mistakes, like puppies, or I don't know, robot soccer players. Door elusive, can it contain him? Snapping ankles along the way. Run again, this run is uncontainable. Oh, Goal! Yeah. Goal! All right. The manner here, 
does not lead you to think these are going to be superstar soccer players, right? The right manner helps us to anticipate and forgive and recover from error. It may sometimes be annoying, even puppies. Even my poor little puppy can be annoying. But it won't surprise us or at worst endanger us. I think too often when machines make a mistake, it simply feels a little bit more like this. <laughs> just, a, just a doll, not a baby. No babies were hurt in this video, just a doll. But it's like, here, have this delicious milk. <laughs> Setting a wrong expectation, the manner is all wrong. And that's about the design. That's about the expectation setting, the presentation of what's about to happen. How do we cushion mistakes? How do we set expectations? And so I think one of the important things of this is that because the machines are weird, we have to do more than just report their results. We have to think about the language and manner that we bring to this stuff. Nobody knows that lesson more than Pick Deskbot. Pick Deskbot is a Twitter bot that basically just takes a random image from Mi Wikimedia and submits it to Microsoft's image recognition service and just reports the description that comes back. And you can actually see in a lot of cases, it's quite good. This is a really complex image and the language that comes back, it's cattle grazing on a lush green field. It's very, very nicely described. Uh, more often, though, it's sort of you'll find some funny things where it sort of gets a little confused. The phones just keep getting bigger, don't they? I don't know if you're familiar with Samsung's latest here. So you could say a person holding a cell phone, but actually we find that actually studies have shown that it's better to be more vague uh, and correct than specific and incorrect. So studies particularly around uh, showing machine-generated descriptions to people with a visu visual disability, to the, to the blind. Uh, so instead, and maybe a better way that at least doesn't have that kind of problem is just to sort of be sort of vague like a person holding an object. But then that also sort of takes away the stuff that it's, it's not sure about that maybe it can suggest some of its low confidence guesses. A person holding an object or maybe a cell phone? or a guitar, or a violin. The algorithms often report several possible things that are in there with sort of a different amount of confidence. And we can sort of support, present those, not by sort of saying 55% confidence in this, but actually using language in the same way that we would as people. It's holding something. Maybe this? Manner is important. Language is important. The second part that these things are important about, and this sort of gets to some of the, the mistakes that sometimes we see in certain uh, image recognition algorithms, is that the machines are really good at just very narrow domains. Uh, so one example of that, just very, a very narrowly focused tool, is a tool called CycleGAN. It's a neural network that's trained on pictures of horses or fruit and taught to transform them. So a picture of apples becomes a picture of oranges, or if you've got a horse, your horse, boom, turns into a zebra. That's pretty good. It does occasionally get a little confused <laughs> when you run pictures through that don't fit the model. Yeah, I'm sure you didn't know this about Vladimir Putin. But you also see, look at the background of the rocks. The rocks are turning into zebras too. If it only knows horses, everything is a horse. It's a very narrow problem. And so it's just worth remembering that with all of this, as I mentioned, this is pattern matching. It is not real intelligence. It is not cognition. It is not thinking. There is no judgment to it. There is no expertise or logical inference. There is simply matching at a vast but ultimately childlike level, which is sort of something I think that uh, Benedict Evans suggested with this when he said, this is more like having infinite interns or infinite 10-year-olds, infinite puppies, right? which still has value. Five years ago, if you gave a computer a pile of photos, it couldn't do much more than sort them by size or maybe identify some primary colors in those. Huge leaps in image recognition since then. Of course, a 10-year-old might be able to sort those into, for example, I don't know, men and women. A 15-year-old could perhaps sort them into cool and uncool. An intern might be able to say, hey, this is interesting. We're still challenged, challenged to work at the intern level. We're still maybe still at the 10-year-old or 15-year-old level. Uh, but what would you do if you had a million 15-year-olds 
look at their data and sort of come to some conclusions or suggestions? What might they find in some narrow domain? So what that means is when you're thinking about things, and this sort of matches to that idea of, of, of kind of casual uses of machine learning, mundane, simple uses of them, is that we can solve narrow problems. Those don't have to be small problems, though. Um, for example, Deep Patient uh, is a, a system for healthcare that analyzed hundreds and hundreds of thousands of patient records looking for patterns, any kind of patterns, to identify what's, what's happening with people. And one of the things that it turned out to be really good at is it, that it could identify schizophrenia about two years earlier than human doctors would based on sort of patient history. In one case, this is sort of great. It's like, wow, this is amazing. We are able to diagnose this challenging mental health condition years in advance. And perhaps now we know something about what the causes of this are. This can give human doctors some insight. But it turns out it doesn't. All it does is it goes ka-chunk, 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 ding, schizophrenia, with no explanation or logic for how it found that condition. In fact, even the people who built the system don't know how it works completely impenetrable. So it, it's useful in the sense that it's sort of like, hey, doctors, you should pay attention to this, focusing human attention and judgment on that. But it also doesn't sort of say why. If we don't know how an answer was arrived at, can we actually call that knowledge? I suppose that's a larger existential question. But again, it's, it's okay to focus on small questions too. Those can be meaningful. But this gets at sort of one of the third areas of, of this that I think is important, is that the systems do have this opaque logic. And I think that's an important thing to understand about the texture of this thing. Here's a ridiculous example about me. But friends, by now, I feel like we're close enough that I can share this with you. Just many of you use Spotify, the Discover playlist. And it's, it's super accurate, right? It's like, it's like, wow, all right, yes, that is my kind of music. The trouble is that whenever I listen to it, it sounds like this. Oh, my Discover playlist is so uncool. It's all like dad rock. I am so uncool, and I wish I was cooler, and I'm actually embarrassed a lot of times by the songs that it plays to me that I hear privately, because apparently I care what their algorithm thinks of me. I don't know if any of you do this, but sometimes I will be like, I'm going to try to listen to some cooler music this week. I'm going to change my Discover playlist. Uh, but that also means that I, I'm also, at the same time, I'm afraid to skip a song because I, I don't actually know what's going to happen. Like, does this mean that this song is never going to be played again? The song that I secretly, and please don't tell anybody, secretly love? It's like my mental model of it isn't clear of how my activity changes. I know it's watching me. I know it's sort of cataloging this stuff, but I don't understand how it works. So I'm paralyzed. I don't know what to do. So one of the things is, how can we be sort of transparent with people about how the model works, at least when we're taking data to affect the model and influence it? I think part of our obligation together is to create data literacy to help people understand not only how our services work, but kind of how the internet works today, but how our personal data sharing works and how it's used. How does the system behave? What signals does it observe? What is it optimized for? So I am totally riffing here, but just one example with Spotify is that the interface could give explicit feedback to indicate how skipping a song affects your profile, if at all. And so sort of just by saying, great, we've skipped it, you have the option to remove it from your history, means A, I have the agency to do that, but also it suggests that it hasn't been done yet, that it's still in there, I'm just skipping the song. You get the idea. Again, it's about language and manner, and again, transparency. Something that actually helps me to have some agency in this and collaborate in crafting my own sort of music history. So because the logic is opaque, we have to signal our intention and be transparent. And I think this is a problem because I would say that transparency is not exactly a value of our industry, and certainly not in Silicon Valley. If you're an Android user and you have Chrome running in the background and you just let it sit, don't even use your phone. It just sends Google your location information about 340 times an hour. You walk away from it, it's firing off every 10 seconds when you're not even using your phone, sharing your location. Facebook gathers your info from your, contact, your friend's contacts, so they're building an ad profile of you even if you're not part of the network. You're giving up your friends just by using the service. Worse, 
When you give your phone number for double authentication, for security, Facebook makes that phone number available for ad targeting so that advertisers who happen to have a database with your phone number in it can target you. Twitter just admitted uh, a week or two ago that it had inadvertently done the same thing. But I'm pretty sure they didn't inadvertently take the advertiser's money. I'm pretty sure they kept that. Now, you might say, well, I don't know. We can't tell people that we're doing stuff like this. If we tell people what we're doing, how we're harvesting their data, people might not sign up. They might be turned off. And I think that's a pretty good signal. If you think people won't like it, maybe you shouldn't do it. Right? How can we make transparency a default design principle? Surface these things in the use of the actual application and be really clear what the system is optimized for. The system itself should declare what it's optimized for, and we should be clear about it, not just with our customers, but also within our own teams. What do we want this thing to do? How, if, especially if the logic is opaque and we're not sure exactly how it's working, let's at least be incredibly intentional about the results that we want to see so that we can measure them and measure them a lot. Is the system delivering on what it's optimized for? And is it possibly undermining other things that we care about but aren't explicitly optimizing for. Fix the systems when they don't work, celebrate and improve them when they do. So we might not always or ever understand how the systems think, but we can understand and compare their results. So do that. This is a really important one. I would say maybe this is the most important thing to, to remember as you're designing sort of for algorithmic interfaces, is machine learning sees the world in shades of gray not in black and white. Everything is probabilistic. It's all probabilities. Its algorithms are pretty explicit about their confidence, too, and their predictions. So let's take a look at this. One of the tools that you can use, there are many of these, is sort of like all of the big technology companies, at the same time as they are competing to have the most accurate uh, and, and compelling sort of mainstream machine learning services around image recognition, speech recognition, and the like, are also kind of competing to give those away. And so you can go to any of the hosting companies like Azure or Google Cloud or Amazon Web Services, and if you use their hosting thing or sign up for a free plan, you get access to these machine learning services. So I want to, let's take a look very sort of quickly at Microsoft's cognitive services, part of the Azure plan, just to sort of get a, a sense of this and also see what I'm talking about, about how they report these probabilities, this confidence. I am just self-absorbed enough to try this on a picture of me. Here we go. It actually does pretty well, right? It's sort of saying, all right, this is a man looking at the camera. And you can see a confidence level there, too. It's saying 89% confidence. All right, that's, that's probably enough to go with. Not, I confess I'm not totally comfortable with some of their results. And I mean, come on. Come on. It's the kind of thing that'll really stick with you. I'm working on it, you guys. I'm working on it. Elephant, man. But you can look at the percentages to get a sense of the confidence. So here, you know, at the bottom, we can kind of see here that we've got things like person really confident that it's a person, right? 99.9668% confident it's a person. Then man, and then indoor. And look at the old, last one, older. I'm happy to say only 28% confidence. So it's not, it wouldn't be right if we go back to manner for it to say, this is an older man. It would be, this is a man, I am not at all sure. Maybe older? It's the beard, I think. I'd say that's what I'm going to go with. But if we look also at the top, you'll see the tags. Uh, which are displayed in sort of descending order of confidence. So very confident in person and man and indoor. And at the very end, I'm happy to say, does not seem to be an elephant. You know, it's like very weak signal on an elephant. So it's the kind of thing of like, this is a picture of a man looking at a camera who could also be an older elephant? Would be the manner that you use there, right? It's like we, a lot of times in our interfaces, we do not surface this confidence information. We just give an answer. Here is the result. And the machines are not good at results. They are good at signals. And how do we think about that in our interfaces? A lot of times we will try to, to the degree that this does get surfaced, I am embarrassed to say that apparently I'm a 72% match for this movie. We try these sort of percent levels of recommendation. And it turns out that actually when you see this in usability tests, is people either gloss over that, the num it's a number, blah, 
or that it has sort of very little meaning to them. I'm not quite sure what that means or sort of what, what a high confidence level actually is. And so again, you know, one of the things that we can do is look at language. So it's like, like we were suggesting here before, maybe a cell phone, maybe a guitar, maybe a violin. In applications like this, the stakes are pretty low, but there are other places where the stakes could be much higher, like law enforcement. We've seen Amazon uh, selling their face recognition algorithms or pattern matching services for predictive policing, sort of shades of minority report to pluck suspects out of the wild, and that's pretty serious. Are the machines up to it? Well, the ACLU ran photos of Congress against a data set of 25,000 mugshots, and they got 28 matches. So Amazon has apparently confirmed with science that the United States Congress is a bunch of crooks. But if we look under the hood here, the ACLU left the setting at the default, which declares a match when there's 80% or better confidence. And Amazon, which did not like this news, was like, whoa, 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 hey, these are probabilistic systems. We tell police departments to use at least 95% confidence. This is a probabilistic tool. But in a way, that makes the ACLU's point. The machines require careful tending. Those of us close to the machines, close to these systems, need to understand how confident and accurate they are, of course. But we also need to make that transparent to the users, the civilians who get those results from us. This has real impact. And in this case, you know, if you're thinking about it in a policing context or, or prison sentencing, you know, really hurtful impact. You know, uh, I think a, a good piece of advice to all of us when we're working on this is I don't know is better than a wrong answer. My wife tells me this all the time. I think another way to, to put it too, it's like, I think I know, as we've been talking about, can be pretty helpful. An older elephant, maybe, could be. But how do we sort of get at that uncertainty? I think the, the goal here, in other words, is to sort of present these systems as systems that are smart enough to know when they're not smart enough. And in fact, as we've seen, they actually do report when they're guessing. Their, sort of, uh, their amount of certainty is explicit in the algorithm, but we too often do not surface or do anything with that in our interfaces, which means that we have to be familiar with the texture and content of those models. This seriously, I think, maybe is the most important thing here today, is that we cannot treat the results of these things as flat black and white answers. We have to think about treating things as signals. And the way that we think about these signals is important too because they're not always, sig they're, they're always signals that are relative to a baseline of normal. The whole point of machine learning is to understand what is normal, what is average, and then predict the next normal thing or to find discrepancies from normal for fraud or, or crime or disease, for example. But what is normal? You know, this is sort of, this is a hard thing. I was like, what is that baseline? That's all about the data that you give to it. If you ask Microsoft's image recognition service if this is a man or a woman, it will say David Bowie is a woman. And we are in a, in a global conversation right now, a cultural conversation around gender and sexuality that is, um, you know, a challenging one for human beings. How are the machines supposed to make sense of it? And what if this understood notion of normal becomes outdated or isn't even accurate in the first place? What if our machines learn from us our own bad or dubious choices? What if they absorb and reinforce existing inequalities or leave out entire categories of people? We saw this, for example, with Amazon a little under a year ago when they had a recruiting tool, a machine learning recru recruiting tool that would evaluate job applicants and people looking for a promotion, and it found bias against women. And they immediately threw that out. This, is, of course, is alarming. This is the kind of harmful stuff that I was talking about that can happen. If there is a silver lining, and I don't want to treat this casually, but if there is a silver lining, bias, when, we, when it's surfaced, lets us act on it. The machines surface this bias naively, in a matter-of-fact way, without hiding it, without embarrassment. They make obvious what's always lurked beneath. And so it reveals the problems that we have to solve or address. Maybe in our mathematical models, maybe in our data, but often just in the way that our culture operates or the limitations of our own narrow professional circle. So when bias is revealed, we can act on it. It gives us signals for necessary change. We may not be able to eliminate 
bias from our data, but we can certainly surface that bias as a call to action. And that comes back to what I was saying earlier about the opaque nature of the machines, is that we have to measure. We have to be clear what we're optimizing for, but also be careful that we aren't inadvertently de-optimizing something that is important to us, as Amazon did. And as Amazon is taking action, they're like, oh, wait a second, this has surfaced a problem in the way that we operate. All right. So a bunch of different ways that there's sort of this grain and texture of machine learning that requires us to think about our interfaces in new ways. How do we do that? But I think another important thing is, how does this change us? How do our values and behaviors shift? What intentions are we going to bring to this technology? And how willing are we to consider that things will go wrong? Because the machines, again, are weird and unreliable. You know, how, what, what we, will we do when that technology has unintended consequences? So in the same way that we sort of need to ask, you know, what do we want from it? What can it do for us? We also need to ask, what does it require of us beyond the interaction? What is the larger outcome that we want to see? What trade-offs are we willing to make? Because if we don't decide for ourselves, the technology will decide for us. And friends, I will say that we do not want the future to be self-driving. This should be up to us. The people in this room get to decide the values and intention of these services. Software is ideological. It is political. It has values embedded in it from the people who make it and the data that is brought into it. And we may not always be aware of it or acknowledge of it, but friends, I'm telling you it's so. So let's be intentional about it and decide what kind of world that we want to create with it so that the technology bends to our lives instead of the reverse. Otherwise, it's the technology that runs the show. It's the case of the tea kettle holding Mark Rittman and his family hostage, working hard to restore the network just to normalize their life and keep the kettle happy. So, you know, as I said, this is, a, this is a future that's up to us. How do we embrace the texture of this new technology? How do we think about incorporating it into our daily practice, the products that we're already creating? And friends, you know, this is sort of something, as we've seen, this could go sideways in a few different ways, but I am optimistic. I choose to be enthusiastic about this. I believe in the people in this room to make exciting decisions, good decisions, with these new powerful tools for meaningful change and, and human insight. So let's work together to build something that, that serves everyone, that builds a world that we all want to live with. I think this is a time to be generous and to share ideas, and frankly, to have some wild ideas. Put these tools to work, the tools that are available right now in small interventions, even in the humble web form, but also to think about larger opportunities. We have the tools to make something amazing, so, so please do that. If you're interested in learning more about this, I want to steer you to a, a few other resources. Mindfultechnology.com is a, a movement for creating technologies that, fo that help you to focus and focus you on, on uh, important things rather than distract you. UVET Agenda is the output of a, a retreat that I attended in uh, Norway, sort of ask, framing the important questions that we need to consider as we go into a world of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And finally, my own site, bigmedium.com, where you can find writings and videos and more about this. And friends, with that, I think there's only one thing to say. So let's stop talking and do some walking. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, keep it going. Hey, thank you, sir. Uh, so just a quick question. Uh, <laughs> well, I was going to ask you, can you prancer size to Margaritaville? I am the, it's, that is just one degree too much. <laughs> it's just like it's, <laughs> maybe later. I've overshared, I can we'll, see. We'll try it anchored later. Um, uh, just a couple of quick questions before coffee. Um, Joseph is thinking about the x-ray example and thinking about self-driving cars and would like to hear a bit more from you about um, how to navigate when you're when you're designing for life critical stuff what a great question 
with the radiology example, we had like an incredibly high level of sensitivity on that. So in, in the, the case, like for example, where Amazon was saying, oh, wait a second, now we tell people 95% uh, uh, confidence for the really important cases. Similar deal here with this. We did not want any false negatives where something that showed a mass or a problem got passed over. So the whole idea was really to sort of eliminate the obvious negatives and put that in hand. But I think that you ask a great question, what happens, again, there are a lot of unintended consequences here. We as makers bring optimism to what we make. That's, that's how we can create new things. At the same time, we have to bring sort of a healthy skepticism about how these things might fail. And I think that it is actually a worthwhile thing, and I kid you not, to ask the question in any kind of application you're doing, how could somebody die from this? And what are the steps that we would need to take to prevent that from happening ever? In other words, as you're designing for your optimistic cases, also begin to design defensively for the worst case scenarios. And especially in, in things where it's sort of like, you know, where people could be harmed, not just physically, but as we've seen through prison sentencing or being, having their jobs being turned down, that the risk right now, as we cook this, these, these systems into the very operating system of our society for jobs, for health, for uh, um, financial lending, for education, the risk is that we could do real harm and damage. And so we have to have, bring a real responsibility and consideration and sensitivity to that and teach the machines the same. It's a great question. It's an important one. Uh, maybe one more quick one, uh, a harder one to answer, perhaps. Um, someone would like to hear more about harmful or dark patterns in the space. So, you know, the prediction and the classification examples are really healthy and helpful, uh, but we're also horrified by some of the AI abuses that we've been reading yeah. about. So what are some ethical guidelines to use AI responsibly? I would say that if you look at anything that Facebook does to gather your data, there you go. Facebook has the playbook on dark patterns for data gathering in ways that are not at all clear. They are irredeemable on that front. And I would look at anything that Facebook does and say, let's do something completely different from that. Uh, yeah, there you go. Some people agree. It is so important right now that we create some real transparency about how data is being gathered. There are some great laws in, in the EU about that, really well-intentioned laws, but the effect of them has not been what was intended, right? That all that we have now is giant banners telling you that there are cookies on the website. That's been the net effect of the um, really well-intentioned privacy laws here. I think that if you find yourself not being transparent about what your service does or when data is being gathered, that is a huge anti-pattern. I think perhaps maybe the biggest one that we need to do, our responsibility to our customers, to our children, to society, is to have radical transparency around this stuff. Amen. All right. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, sir. Thank you all.